Hey everybody, it's time, it's here, it's the Amon Cat Limited Set Review for White on the Mana Leak. I am John, as always, and we're going to go through every single card in Amon Cat in the color of white today. Up first, we need to go over three very important disclaimers that I always go through in these set reviews. Number one, this is a limited set review. I will be talking predominantly about draft, and to a lesser extent, but definitely still uh, totally applicable, Sealed, which of course will be the pre-release format next weekend. I will not be talking about these cards in relation to Standard or Legacy or Modern or Commander. If I say a card is an F and you think it's the best card ever printed for your Commander deck, that's great. I'm not talking about that. So this is limited only set review. Number two, I have not played with these cards, or at least most of these cards. There's a couple of reprints that I've maybe played with, but I've not played with them. I haven't proxied them out. I haven't tested them. So these are my first approach ratings and opinions. I've not played the format. It could be that the format actually turns out to be a format where you have to win on turn two, and therefore any card that costs four or more mana is literally unplayable. We don't know, but this is my first glance from a vacuum, how I'm going to approach these cards at pre-release, how I'm going to approach these cards the first couple of weekends until I get more experience. The final disclaimer, these are just my opinions. I may not approach the game the same way you do, but discussion about the cards is, in my mind, one of the huge points of set reviews. I don't think set reviews should be, hey, John says that this is this and this is true and you had better follow it. That is not how I approach set reviews. That's not how you should approach anybody's set reviews. I don't care if it's me. I don't care if it's LSV. Set reviews should foster discussion. I say something's an F or an A and you disagree. Talk to me about it. Talk to everybody else in the comments about it. Foster discussion. Anyways, we're going to jump into the first card. We're going to start big with a mythic, Angel of Sanctions. Angel of Sanctions is three white white for a creature angel at mythic. She's a 3-4 flyer. When Angel of Sanctions enters the battlefield, you may exile target non-land permanent on opponent controls until Angel of Sanctions leaves the battlefield. She also has Embalm 5 and a white. Embalm is the first time we've seen this, and we'll see it a lot in, I think, every color. Embalm says that you can exile this card from your graveyard. You create a token that's an exact copy of this card, except it's also a zombie, it's white, which in this case it already is, and it has no mana cost. But let's temper our expectations a little bit. We can only do it as a sorcery. It's kind of unfortunate this one's going first, because this is one of the easiest snap picks of the entire set. It's a Banisher Priest that is also a solid, evasive 3-4 threat with flying. And you get to do it all again, even if an opponent does manage to kill her. There really isn't a grade for her other than A+. I want to open these all day, every day. Absolutely incredible Angel of Sanctions. So let's dial back down a little bit from that. Anointed Procession is second. Anointed Procession is three and a white for an enchantment at rare. If an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many of those tokens instead. So if you're embalming Angel of Sanctions, you get a pair of her, because that seems fair. Uh, yeah, I'm not super sold on an, uh, anointed procession these sort of parallel lives effects have never really been great in limited it's cute if you go off with the embalm or, or you maybe make some cats we'll see some cats soon but really this is going to do nothing a ton of the time and then you'll get a second embalm creature and you'll have felt like you wasted a card slot and a turn and four mana at a bare minimum i'd want probably at least 10 token production methods before I even think about playing this. Have fun with it, but get rid of those magical Christmas land dreams. I'm going to start this at a D plus. I think it's just way too hard to go off with. Anointer Priest is up next. Anointer Priest is one and a white for a creature human cleric at common. She's a 1-3 and she says whenever a creature token enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. Embalm for three and a white. One threes for two aren't really my jam. I don't really like that stat cost ratio. I love three ones for two. And while an Embalm tokens deck uh, might make some use of this, I just don't think this is going to be a star of it. It could be an okay 23rd card, but otherwise I think it's fairly cuttable. The issue that we'll see and that I think is going to pop up with the idea of an Embalm deck is generally you're going to need to cast these creatures first. And then they're going to have to die. And then you're going to have to pay generally more mana than you paid for the first time to even get that first Embalm token. 
So I don't really see embalm.deck happening. We'll see a bunch of other decks happen. We'll see zombie deck. We'll see the idea of a cat deck. But I'm not super sold on pure embalm or pure token deck. So Anointed Priest, it certainly has a place, but I'm going to start it at a C-. I think it's cuttable unless you, again, like Anointed Procession, have an absolute critical mass of token producers. Approach of the Second Sun is up next, a card that I got eviscerated for misreading on the spoiler recaps. A no approach of the Second Sun is six and a white for a sorcery at rare. If Approach of the Second Sun was cast from your hand and you've cast another spell named Approach of the Second Sun this game, I misread it as this turn, you win the game. Otherwise, put Approach of the Second Sun into its owner's library seventh from the top and you gain seven life. Now, with my misreading, I assumed you were going to need a spell copying device or a second copy of this and it just wasn't going to happen. Reading it properly, it's obvious that this is simply a seven-turn clock. However, a seven-turn clock is still an extraordinarily long clock, especially when your opponent knows about it. Uh, I'm not really into making the game last another seven turns, especially in white, uh, a color that's generally going to be attacking. Uh, trust me, I love alternate win conditions, but this just feels like it's going to be way, way, way too slow most of the time, and in the really the wrong color to be slow. So I'm going to go with D plus on this. Build around it, have some fun with it, but uh, don't expect too, too much of it. Even Mind Sensor is up next, a reprint from Future Sight. Two and a white for a creature bird wizard at rare. It's a 2-1 flash, flying. If an opponent would search a library, that player searches the top four cards of that library instead. So this shuts down all kinds of things in modern, and I'm sure it'll shut down a bunch of things in uh, standard. But in limited, this is basically just going to be a 2-1 flash flyer for three which is fine. It's not unheard of to play a 2-1 flyer for three. It dies to basically every, every single burn spell ever invented and uh, can't block or really attack worth a damn in the air if there's anything else there. So it's not a super high pick other than the fact that it might have a few dollars of value attached to it. Not an amazing card in limited by any stretch of the imagination. It's a fine mid-pack pick where you would pick a three mana 2-1 flash flyer. So I'm going to go with C plus on it. But uh don't really expect that ability, the, uh, the the search ability, to really come into play that often. Up next is Binding Mummy. Binding Mummy is one and a white for a creature zombie at common. It's a 2-2. Whenever another zombie enters the battlefield under your control, you may tap target artifact or creature. Let me tell you, there's a zombie deck in this format. And if you weren't aware, the set will hit you over the head with it a billion more times throughout the white set review and the black set review. There's a zombie deck. Unfortunately, because it is so utterly blatant and on the nose, I think it's going to be massively overdrafted. It looks incredibly fun. I don't think I'm ever going to get to draft it properly because I think seven other people at the table are going to be trying to draft it as well. Now, pretending that the people at the table are drafting properly for their seat and not just going, hey, I got a card that says zombies on it. I should draft the zombies deck because there's a lot of them. Uh, this card seems fine. It, it seems totally fine in the zombie deck. At worst, it's a 2-2 two, two for 2, which is utterly playable. So it's a bear with an upside. And that upside's pretty darn good if you're getting, you know, 10, 12... 15 zombies in your deck, this will be quite decent. I'm going to go with a C plus on it, our, our sort of standard bear with an upside rating. Uh, if you're in that zombies deck, uh, if you have no other zombies, it's just a pure C. Uh, but boy, this zombie deck is going to get overdrafted heavily because we're going to see zombies matter many, many, many more times. Cartouche of Solidarity is up next. Cartouche of Solidarity is a single white mana for an enchantment aura cartouche. We'll see more on that later. At common, enchant creature you control. When Cartouche of Solidarity enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 white warrior creature token with vigilance. Enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and has first strike. This is the start of a cycle. We'll see a cartouche for each color, and more than that, we'll actually see cartouches interact with another enchantment, the Trials, and we'll see that uh, near the end of this set review. Or is there something generally you want to shy away from? But this one, and a number of the cartouches actually feel very playable. At worst, you'll still have that 1-1 one -one when the dust settles, and an aura that replaces itself like that is something to take a look at. Potentially buffing another creature and giving it the very powerful first strike ability for a single mana isn't something to scoff at either. This isn't a great card. It's not a high pick at all. It's a mid to low pick for sure, but I'm, I'm going to start out playing this, whereas many auras I would never consider main decking uh, at the start of the format. So I'm going to go with a, a middle of the road C. It's not amazing, but it seems totally fine. 
A card that does seem totally fine is Cast Out. Cast Out is 3 and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon with Flash. When Cast Out enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent on opponent controls until Cast Out leaves the battlefield. It's Oblivion Ring, or, or the fixed version of Oblivion Ring. I can't remember what the first one was. Banishing Light? Something like that. Anyways, it's Amazing White Unconditional Removal. It also has another of our mechanics for the set, Cycling. Cycling, one white. So a single white mana, you can discard this card from your hand to draw a card. So if you're on turn four and you have one land down, and it's a planes, and you are desperate for another land, it will feel bad, but you can throw away this card, draw a new one, hopefully get that land that you need and get in there. We'll talk about cycling a whole lot over the rest of these set reviews because it's in every color. And I'm slightly more down on cycling than most people. Now, I'm down to the point of saying cycling is fantastic and I love it. But a lot of people are saying they'll play any card that says the word cycling on it, and I don't agree with that. This card, of course, we're not even going to talk about that because this card is incredible, even if it didn't have cycling. And frankly, I would feel like I've lost the game if I have to cycle this card away. You're not cycling this card. You're cycling this card if you are in the worst situation you've ever been in in your life playing Magic. This is just a straight up A. It's solid unconditional removal. I'm going to pick it first pick in probably every pack I see it unless the bomb is just insane in the pack. Solid A. Love it. Up next is Compulsory Rest. Compulsory Rest is one and a white for an enchantment or a common enchant creature. Enchanted creature can't attack or block. It's passivism. However, enchanted creature has pay two, sacrifice this creature, you gain two life. So it's kind of like uh, a, a slightly fixed pacifism, a pacifism that's not as bad for your opponent because your opponent at some point can pay two mana, sack the creature, and gain two life. That, of course, is ever so slightly worse than pacifism, but I still don't care. Just like how Caught in the Brights was less good because it could still do this and you could still sack it, etc. Just like Exploit made pacifism worse, I don't really care about this. My opponent getting two life for two mana, and me getting rid of a serious threat is totally worth it. I will pick and play this rather highly. I'm going to give it a solid B. Devoted Crop Mate is up next. Devoted Crop Mate is two and a white for a creature, human warrior at uncommon. It's a 3-2. You may exert Devoted Crop Mate as it attacks. When you do, return target creature card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. I'm never really a super big fan of this effect because in limited, your two and one drops are typically really meaningless. Like, really meaningless. They're great on turn one and turn two, and later in the game, they're garbage. Taking a turn off attacking with a 3-2 just to get back a 2-2 or worse doesn't seem great to me. As we'll see later in the week, there are some really juicy two-drop targets, uh, especially in red and green, but you really need to have those. So if you have a really, really, really good reason, I can see rating this higher, but as is, I'm going to keep this at a C plus just above filler level. Up next is Jeru's Resolve. Jeru's Resolve is a single white mana for an instant at common. Untap target creature, prevent all damage that will be dealt to it this turn. Cycling for two generic mana. This is definitely worse than God's Willing or Feet of Resistance, which are similar spells. God's Willing gave a scry attached to this ability. Feet of Resistance uh, gave a plus one, plus one counter. Um, the issue here, of course, is you have to choose between it being a combat trick or being the incremental advantage of drawing a card. Still, this will be something to keep in mind uh, when you attack in for a quote-unquote safe attack. Probably not supremely worth it in the most tightly drafted decks, but it's totally playable, and cycling is what helps that out. This is a card that has some use. It will come in handy in a number of situations. And when it's not, you know, proving to be useful, throw it away, get something else. The issue I have with cycling is a lot of people are saying you should play this card that, you know, one in 10 times will be useful because you can always just throw it away. The trick is you're never going to be able to keep those cards in hand for that one time. You're just going to throw them away all the time, in which case I would so much rather just play a real card. You know, if I have to, if I'm, you know, struggling for my 23rd card, yeah, I'm going to play a cycling card, even if it's incredibly narrow because I can make it into another card. But in a well-drafted deck, in, a, in, an, in any way, you know, fine sealed pool, I'm not going to play any cycling card just because it says cycle. This one? Totally fine, and I'm going to give it a C. But we'll see others that I will disagree with uh, many other people on. 
Fanbearer is next. Fanbearer is a mummy with a fan. It's a single white mana for a creature zombie at common. It's a 1-2, pay 2 generic mana, tap it to tap target creature. Now tappers are awesome, as we've seen with Gideon's Lawkeeper in the past and Avacyn slash Sigardian Priest, uh, but they all cost 1 mana to tap. And of course, the big daddy of them all, whose name I can't remember, I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments below, you simply tapped, you didn't pay any mana. Paying 2 is a lot, that's a lot to ask for. However, if the format is as slow as I expect it to be, this could still be okay. It's a far cry from those great tappers that we've had in the past, so I will still put this at a keep it or leave it middle of the road C. Uh, it could be slightly better if the format is really friendly to being this slow, but I'll keep an eye on it, starting it out at a C. Forsake the Worldly is two and a white for an instant at common, exile target artifact or enchantment, cycling for two generic mana. Now this is a perfect example of another of these cards that I'm never going to play just because they say cycling and other people have said, oh man, you put this in every deck and you know, one out of a hundred times you'll get to kill an artifact that was important and the rest of the time you'll get to draw another card. I would rather play something actually good. As always, in sealed, if I have to, sure. I'll play this if I desperately need a white card. In draft, I'm not going to be picking this. I'm not going to be playing it. Uh, I'll keep it in the sideboard in case there's a, an as foretold that we'll see tomorrow, which is a disgusting enchantment or something I really need to get rid of, but I'm going to keep it at a D+. I'm not going to play it just because it says cycling. All right, let's move on to a big card. Gideon of the Trials. Gideon is on Amonkhet, of course. He's one white white for a mythic Planeswalker Gideon starting at three loyalty. For his plus one ability, until your next turn, prevent all damage target permanent would deal. For zero, until end of turn, Gideon of the Trials becomes a 4-4 human soldier creature with indestructible that's still a planeswalker prevent all damage that would be dealt to him this turn. Also for zero, he doesn't technically have an ultimate, unless you want to call this the ultimate, you get an emblem with, quote, as long as you control a Gideon planeswalker, you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. Those are some spicy words there at the end. Now, Gideon, we're not gonna mince any words here. He is fantastic. He is, however, going to just miss the A plus grade from me and only get an A, primarily due to not establishing a board presence. He defends himself with the bubble, you know, preventing damage from one permanent. However, against a real force of creatures, it's not going to do much. His ability to attack is, of course, great. We've seen that on every Gideon ever printed. And yeah, the ultimate is really cool but it is still very beatable if you're not also establishing your board to stop Gideon from just dying from creatures, at which point that emblem doesn't matter anymore. Still a very, very solid Planeswalker, especially due to being only three mana. And uh, yeah, Gideon just misses that A-plus grade for me. If he made soldiers or something, he'd be off the charts. But solid A, Gideon looks fantastic, even if I'm not as sold on that ultimate being as backbreaking as some people have thought. Well, Gideon's come to save us all. Gideon's Intervention is too white-white for an enchantment at rare. As Gideon's Intervention enters the battlefield, choose a card name. Any card name. Your opponent can't cast spells with the chosen name. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to you and permanent you control by sources with the chosen name. We've seen cards similar to this before, like Lost Legacy, like Slaughter Games, cards that rip, rip cards out of your opponent's deck or hand, etc., that you just name out of the blue. This is similar, except of course your opponent can reverse that from happening if they do ever destroy the enchantment. But these are just not cards that ever see play in Limited. You should never really play them. They're constructed sideboard cards is what they are. Similar to Lost Legacy, there's just infinitely better ways of dealing with your opponent's bombs and planeswalkers and etc than playing this excruciatingly narrow card. I'm going to give this a straight up F. Don't play it. Glory Bound Initiate is up next. Glory Bound Initiate is one and a white for a creature human warrior at rare. He's a 3-1. Love those stats. You may exert Glory Bound Initiate as it attacks. When you do, it gets plus one, plus three, and gains lifelink until end of turn. Exert is one of the new mechanics for Amonkhet. Exert says an exerted creature won't untap during your next untap step. So when you decide to attack with this, you can say he's going to get exerted, which means he won't untap during the next step, and he gets this bonus. As I've said, I adore three ones for two in white. They're my 
favorite kind of vanilla stats to cost ratio because they're so aggressive. This coming down on turn two, if your opponent stumbles on a creature, they're taking three, then they're taking six. Follow it up with removal, they're at nine. Real aggressive, love it. Now they typically fall off because you know, before long, your opponent's going to start playing magic and they're going to have a 1-1 one, one that chumps and kills it. This gets around that. When it gets to the point of the game where your opponent has blockers for it, you just start attacking with this every other turn as a 4-4 four, four lifelinker. Uh, this seems fantastic. It's not immediately game winning. There's no evasion or anything. So I'm not going to go into the A territory with this, but I'm going to give this a solid B+. I love this card. Love it, love it, love it. Gustwalker is up next. Gustwalker is one and a white for a creature human wizard at common. It's a 2-2. It's a bear with an upside. You may exert Gustwalker as it attacks. When you do, it gets plus one, plus one and gains flying until end of turn. It's a heck of a bear with an upside. I think my general plan with this would be to attack for two every turn while I can. That way I can attack, you know, on turn three and turn four if my opponent's stumbling. And then when they start to get blockers, start sending it into the air every other turn. This just looks really good to me, especially for a common. I, I'm going to start it at C+, the sort of average bear with an upside grade, but I could see this even ever so slightly pushing into B-minus territory. Uh, a bear that can fly on its own? Oh, seems real good to me. Up next is an extremely recent reprint, Impeccable Timing, which we just saw in Kaladesh. Impeccable Timing is one and a white for an instant at common. Impeccable Timing deals three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. This I always found totally fine in Kaladesh. A lot of people were super down on it, you know, saying that it wasn't even arguably playable. I flat out disagree with that. I'm going to stick with my C plus rating that I gave it in Kaladesh and send that right through Amonkhet, even though I know people are going to rate this lower than me. I think it's fine removal. It's not a high pitch. Pick. You're going to pick this, you know, mid pack at the earliest, but I'd play it most times that I have it. So C plus for impeccable timing yet again. Inoketra's name is up next. Inoketra's name is one and a white for an instant at common. Zombies you control get plus two plus one until end of turn. Other creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn. Yet another pounding over the head. Hey, play zombies. Zombies is a deck. Please play zombies. I want to play zombies. Uh I really hope that it is draftable. Anyways, the plus one plus one part of this is not terribly playable. It's a far, far, far cry from the power of something like Overrun. Uh, plus two plus one is an effect we've seen in white a lot in the past few years. And at instant, it's always relatively decent in a go wide deck. But it's only the zombies. So you're going to need to be deep in that zombie deck for this to feel like a, a war flare or uh, an inspiring charge or whatever you want to call plus two plus one in white. Um, yeah, we'll have to see how playable that zombie deck is outside of the zombie deck. This is probably like a D plus and even really inside that zombie deck, unless you're successfully going super wide, this is probably still at best a C. Mighty Leap is up next, another recent reprint. I think we saw it in a Modern Masters set, probably Modern Masters 2015, maybe? Anyways, Mighty Leap is one and a white for an instant at common. Target creature gets plus two, plus two, and gains flying until end of turn. It's a totally fine combat trick. Uh, plus two, plus two for two is nice enough stats. It's no giant growth, but eh. Getting flying is kind of cool, but of course you're going to have to do that before blocks, which means your opponent is going to know about it at least. Uh, it's a, you know, a relatively fine to slightly mediocre combat trick. Uh, you'll lose to it. I'll lose to it for sure. I like it more in sealed where you're more scrounging for playables, but in draft, I'd take this pretty late and I'd probably still just cut it a lot of the time. So I'm going to go with a C minus on Mighty Leap. Well, we saw in Oketra's name. Who is Oketra? Well, Oketra is Oketra the True. Oketra the True is three and a white for a legendary creature god. She's a mythic, 3-6, with double strike and indestructible. Sounds a bit broken. Well, Oketra the True can't attack or block unless you control at least three other creatures, not including her. Pay three and a white, create a 1-1 one, one white warrior creature token with vigilance. This, of course, is the start of the god cycle. All of them are indestructible, and all of them are pacified until something is met. And they all turn themselves on in one way or another. Oketra seems pretty great. Getting three creatures on the board naturally isn't that hard. And once she's on, you're going to have an insane blocker, a 3-6 double strike indestructible, who's also an incredible attacker if you can get in. Turning yourself on isn't too hard either. If the game's gone long enough, uh, you know, four mana to make a creature. If it's turn eight and you've got eight mana, there she is two thirds of the way on. And that's in a worst case 
you have no board presence scenario. Um, she also just creates chump blockers every turn if you need that w without quite turning yourself on. Um, she just seems fantastic in most cases, other than being behind and not having the mana to establish some sort of board. You know, if you only have four mana to cast her and nothing on board, she's not the best, but I, I'm, I'm sitting on an A on her. I think she's fantastic. I'm going to slam pick her the first time I see her. Oketra's Attendant is up next. Oketra's Attendant is three white white for a creature bird soldier at Uncommon. It's a 3-3 with flying. It has cycling for two generic mana. And it has Embalm for three white white. The exact same cost as its casting cost, which isn't terribly common. Uh, yeah, this is a 3-3 flyer for five, which is, you know, pretty normal. We'd pay that and be fine with it. It would be like a kind of a C at that level. The fact that if it dies, we can get it back again for the exact same cost, giving us essentially two copies of this card in the deck. That's pretty darn good as well. And the ability to throw this away earlier in the game when we need lands or we need something other than this, and then have it in the graveyard to bring it back. Fantastic. This just seems great. It's possibly the best on common not removal spell in white. I'm pretty happy with it. I, th I think this is a solid B. Uh, I will very happily pick Oketra's Attendant very, very highly. Protection of the Hecma is up next. Protection of the Hecma is four and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon. If a source an opponent controls would deal damage to you, prevent one of that damage. Let me consult my notes. I have written, LOL, no. Uh, this is exceedingly bad. It it's five mana to prevent a single damage per source which just isn't worth it in any world. Uh, uh, avoid this card like the absolute plague. Which, wait a minute, where are our biblical Egyptian plague cards? We should see those, maybe in maybe an hour of station, who knows. Anyways, this card, straight F, straight F. You wanna know what's not an F? Regal Caracal, Regal Caracal is three white white for a creature cat at rare, it's a three three. It says other cats you control get plus one, plus one, and have lifelink. They finally did it. They made a cat lord. It has more text. When Regal Caracal enters the battlefield, create two one, one white cat creature tokens with lifelink. This is nuts. Even if you have no other cats, this is a seven, seven lifelink for five, which is utterly bonkers. If the lord dies, yes, you have a couple of one, one lifelinkers, but that's still fine. You ate some removal and have a pair of 1-1 lifelinkers? Totally fine. If you can get some other cats tossed in here, this just gets amazing. Still, due to the vulnerability that lords often represent, it's not going to get an insane grade, but I am going to put it at an A-. 7-7 seven, seven lifelink for 5. Utterly insane. Renewed Faith is up next. Renewed Faith is 2 and a white for an instant at uncommon. You gain 6 life. Cycling for 1 and a white. When you cycle Renewed Faith, you may gain two life. This is a cycle of cycling cards where you actually get something other than drawing a card or, or in addition to drawing a card when you do cycle it. And this is one that I'm going to have to maybe learn a hard lesson on or maybe people are just overhyping it. This is one of the cards where I look at it and I say, I don't want a card that says you gain six life. I am never, ever playing a three mana card that says you gain six life. That's just not happening. So realistically, this card is one and a white, draw a card, gain two life. That's fine, but I still don't really know that that's really worth a card in my deck. If I'm in sealed and I really want to play white and I need one more playable and I have this, sure, I'll play it if there's nothing better. But this is one of these cards where I just don't want to play this just because it says cycling. So I am rather out on renewed faith. I'm actually going to go with a D minus on it. I just don't see this being a powerful, useful card just because it says cycling. So I'm out on this card. I'm ready to be proven wrong. Uh, I know a lot of people have said that this is utterly playable in every single white deck ever. We'll see. I'm going to start at that D minus. Up next is Retcrop Spearmaster. Retcrop Spearmaster is two and a white for a creature human warrior at common. It's a three one. You may exert Retcrop Spearmaster as it attacks. When you do, it gets plus one plus zero and gains first strike 
until end of turn. Uh, yeah, this is a 3-1 for 3. I love 3-1s for 2, but 3-1s for 3 are much less good in my eyes. Getting to attack as a 4-2 first striker every other turn is okay, but 4-2 first strike is frequently way better than it looks because it still dies to an awful lot, including just a couple of minus one minus one counters, which is a mechanic in this set, and of course, just a magma spray, which is in the set as well. I'll keep this middle of the road kind of C. I'll cut it if I want it, or I'll cut it if I want to, and I'll play it if I want to. Uh, yeah, it's not quite as good as you'll always hope it will be, but it's still fine. Well, what's a cat lord without cats, right? Up next is Sacred Cat. Sacred Cat is a single white mana for a creature cat at common. It's a 1-1, it has lifelink, and it has embalm also for a single white mana. Uh, I'm not really sold on Sacred Cat. I need a really good reason. So there was a card called Trained Caracal, which was exactly this card. It was even a cat in Return to Ravnica, and it was not good. It was utterly unplayable. The fact that you can get this back when it dies, I'm still going with unplayable on this. If you have Regal Caracal, it's a little bit better. If you have a real critical mass of things to uh, kill this off, to sacrifice it, to put minus one, minus one counters on it, we'll see all of this later in different colors. It gets a little bit more playable, but you need a critical mass of things. Uh, without that, I'm going to give this a D+. Plus. I don't think you should ever really play this unless you have an excruciatingly good reason. It's nowhere near as good as you think it is. Up next is another angel, Seraph of the Sun. Seraph of the Suns is five white white for a creature angel at Uncommon. She's a 4-4 four four with flying and indestructible. She's bulletproof. She, she's going to live through a whole bunch of different things. Uh, a 4-4 four, four angel that's not dying outside of exile or minus one, minus one counters seems very nice, but... Seven mana is asking a whole lot. I certainly expect this format to be slow, but formats need to be glacially slow for a seven drop to be playable. I think this is really only going to fit in very specific decks, especially without cycling attached to it. Uh, I'm going to start quite low on this, but if the format is very slow, and if you're in the right deck that is definitely built to last till turn seven this could be the finisher or stabilizer that you need i'm going to start it at a c but absolutely if the format is friendly to it and if you're in the right deck it's going to be a whole heck of a lot higher and if you're not you should never play it at all sparring mummy comes in next sparring mummy is three and a white for a creature zombie at common it's a three three when sparring mummy enters the battlefield untap target creature i'm not entirely sure why sparring untap something I, I almost feel it should tap it or something or train it, but sure, whatever. This is fine. It's a 3-3 three, three for 4, which is playable if you need it. It's not ideal, but it's fine. Uh, not at all something you'd go out of, the, out of your way for. Untapping uh, an attacker to give them pseudo vigilance, or, or untapping an exerted creature would be nice, but it's not really anything that I'd write home about either. This just seems like a straight middle of the road C for me. I'm not going to go up to C plus with it failing the vanilla test, so middle of the road C. Up next is Supply Caravan. Supply Caravan is four and a white for a creature camel at common. It's a 3-5. When Supply Caravan enters the battlefield, if you control a tapped creature, create a 1-1 one, one white warrior creature token with vigilance. Uh, I'm not super stoked on this. I'm not a big fan of 3-5s for 5, nor am I a big fan of 4-6s for 5. They just don't grab me. They're not what I want. With the white, I'm typically wanting to be aggressive. There's no real reason for me to be gumming up the board with something dumb like this. And that 1-1 one, one being conditional, I'll pass on this. This is super filler level. Uh, it's sealed playable. You know, if you need a white creature in sealed, you're not always going to have the most amazing of cards. But don't go out of your way to grab these or play them. Uh, I'm going to go with a, a D plus on it. Maybe bring it out of the sideboard if you're dying way too fast or something. Next up is Ta Crop Elite. Ta Crop Elite is three and a white for a creature bird warrior at common. It's a 2 2 flyer. You may exert Ta Crop Elite as it attacks. When you do, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. This seems really good. It seems kind of on par with Dawn Feather Eagle. Just a Dawn Feather Eagle that your opponent gets to see coming, you know, at least a turn early. Still, you can repeat the trick every other turn, which is nice. Ultimately, I think this is going to require either an evasive blue-white flyers deck or, or just a really aggressive go-wide deck to work, but I think it's going to work great in those spots. 
I'm totally fine with giving this a C plus. Sometimes it's going to feel a little bit higher than that in kind of the B minus range. But yeah, this just seems like a fine, slightly slow, but repeatable Don Feather Eagle. Those Who Serve is next up, and it's very, very vanilla. Two and a white for a creature zombie at common, two, four, end of story. That's it, just a whole bunch of flavor text. Two fours for three are better than two fours for four, but something that you should still cut pretty readily unless you're explicitly planning for the long game and you really need a way to survive and you didn't get enough removal or something. Maybe this buys you some time to the Seraph of the Suns or something, but really this is primarily going to be played in sealed where you simply don't have a great choice of creatures. Uh, but in draft, I think you're going to cut this pretty darn readily and not actively take it. So we're going to go with a C minus. Time to Reflect is up next. Time to Reflect is a single white mana for an instant at Uncommon. Exiled target creature that blocked or was blocked by a zombie this turn. Hey! There's a zombie deck in this set. Did you guys know that? Uh, yeah, I, I, this is just another card that's going to hammer people over the head to get into the zombie deck. And this is obviously excruciatingly narrow. This is, this is an F if you have barely any zombies in your deck, and if your deck is 100% zombies, this is an A. This is swords to plowshares, uh, but no life gain even attached to it. Um, uh, there's no real grade that you can give this kind of across the board. You're going to know if you want this or not, but boy, uh, I want the zombie deck to work, but I'm going to have to caution against drafting it too heavily because I think it's going to be a very overdrafted. Trial of Solidarity is up next. These are the enchantments that go with the cartouches. Trial of Solidarity is two and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon. When Trial of Solidarity enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus two, plus one, and gain vigilance until end of turn. When a cartouche enters the battlefield under your control, return Trial of Solidarity to its owner's hand. So the cartouches are those five auras that we'll talk about that have the cartouche subtype on them. Uh, yeah, this is all right. If you're just pretending it's a sorcery speed plus two plus one spell, which we've seen before and have been okay if you're going super, super wide. I don't see much of a point in going out of your way to recur this, though. You know, the plus two plus one spells, you play them in decks where they end the game. They don't do some damage and then you hope you draw your second one. They are game enders. So I'm not too impressed by this trial. I, I'm plenty impressed by some of the ones that we're going to see in other col colors, but this one, I'm going to go with a C- minus on it. I'm going to say pretend this is a combat trick and nothing else. True Heart Duelist is up next. True Heart Duelist is one and a white for a creature human soldier at Uncommon. To 2-2, two -two, True Heart Duelist can block an additional creature each combat. Embalm for two and a white, so just one more than the uh, the original casting cost. So this is a bear with an upside, which is already a minimum of a C plus generally, unless the upside is awful. Uh, even though that ability isn't likely to do too, too much beyond being an extra chump block. You know, it's not like this guy's going to get two people and kill them both. It's just going to be kill one and chump block the other, or maybe just chump block both. Uh, being able to bring this bear back once for what's probably a more reasonable cost at the time that this thing has died already seems fine as well. Ultimately, we're just going to keep this at bear with an upside rating of C+. Unwavering Initiate is up next. Unwavering Initiate is two and a white for a creature human warrior at common. It's a 3-2 with Vigilance and Embalm four and a white. Not all the Embalm creatures can be, you know, the same cost or just slightly more. We've got to see some bad ones too. Uh, yeah, this is a, a, a fairly bad one. 3-2 for three is fine. Longtime viewers will, of course, know that I don't place much of a premium on Vigilance. It's totally fine. It's nice to have, but it's not something to go out of your way for. Uh, and it's always better if it's paired with Flying or First Strike or a Big Butt, not two toughness. This thing isn't attacking and blocking into uh, any sort of board. It, it's attacking and dying with a board. Paying three for this is basically the maximum I'd ever want to pay. And paying five mana for this the second time around, that's only going to ever happen when I have nothing left to do. Uh, this is filler. It should go quite late. And I think you probably should reliably cut it. So I'm going to go with a C minus. Vizier of Deferment is up next. Vizier of Deferment is two and a white for a creature human cleric at Uncommon. She's a 2-2 two -two with Flash. And when Vizier of Deferment enters the battlefield, you may exile target creature if it attacked or blocked this turn. Return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. I love this card. The versatility is fantastic. You can give pseudo vigilance to a creature. You can attack with it, flash her in and untap it whenever in combat at the end of the end step. 
any time before the turn's over, and they still technically have attacked that turn. You can help out exerted creatures. They're not going to untap next turn, but if you untap them with this, they get to attack again. You can fog an opponent's attacker, taking it out of combat. You can uh, bounce their blocker, getting trample damage through. You can get extra end of the battlefield effects. There's so much that you can do with this one little card. This card's an example of why I'm pretty sure I'm going to love this set. Uh, there's just so much to do with it. There's so many choices. I'm all in on this card as a relatively high white pick. Not first pickable, but high. I'm going to go with a B minus on it. It's not a bomb. It's not a huge creature. I can't as much as I love this card, I can't go any higher, but B minus. We've got another Vizier. Vizier of Remedies is one and a white for a creature human cleric at Uncommon. She's a 2-1. If one or more minus one minus one counters would be put on a creature you control, that many minus one minus one counters minus one, because we can't say that enough, are put on it instead. Uh, this is interesting. It's a piker, which is pretty mediocre in general, a 2-1 for two. Then in some decks, you actively hurt yourself if you're hoping to put minus one minus one counters on your own creatures there's some synergies where you might want to do that not too many though uh but then in other decks it saves you from putting them on and makes that better or even actively hurts your opponent's removal plan i have no idea where to rate this uh there's so much going on here and i feel like it's so narrow yet versatile that i just don't know i'm gonna start it as a sideboard card against minus one, minus one counter removal decks. So I'm going to start it at D plus. Um, maybe C minus is a little bit more appropriate because you'll play a piker if you really need to, but you're not going to go out of your way to do it. Uh, you know, three ones for two, fantastic. Two ones for two, fairly mediocre. So yeah, I, I've talked myself up. Let's go to a C minus for Vizier of Remedies. Up next is Winged Shepherd. Winged Shepherd is five and a white for a creature angel at common. It's a 3-3 three, three, flying vigilance with cycling for a single white mana. This is steep. For six mana, I want something bomby, something game impacty, something game ending, preferably. This is a very, very, very slow game ender. If your opponent's skies are cleared, that is. If they have anything in the air, this probably isn't getting through. Removal blanks the six mana you just wasted on her. Uh, yeah, if you don't get there, you can turn into a random card. But again, I'd just rather play a better card. I think you can cut this with some regularity. Much more playable and sealed. I think, I think all of the bad cards with cycling attached are more playable in sealed where you simply don't have a choice. But in draft, I don't think you should be picking this. So I'm going to go with a C- minus on it. Well, we're out of white cards going from card number one to card number 39. However, I am going to include the monocolored split card. So this is card number 210, Dusk to Dawn. And this is another new mechanic in uh, Amon Ket. I almost said Ether Revolt. No, never again. Uh, uh, Aftermath. Aftermath is basically a second card that comes with a first card. So Dusk is two white white for a sorcery at rare. Destroy all creatures with power three or greater. Then Dawn is three white white for a sorcery that has aftermath saying that you can only cast this from your graveyard and then you exile it after you do so dawn says return all creature cards with power two or less from your graveyard to your hand so dawn cannot be cast when you draw it it cannot be cast combined with dusk you can only play it when it's in your graveyard now, starting out, people are a little bit upset with some of these cards being at rare because they think the effects are uncommon effects or maybe even common effects. But the key thing to remember about these cards is that you're playing the first half and then the second half is an extra free card in your deck. The, the first card does not just say destroy all creatures with power three or greater. It says destroy all creatures with power three or greater and draw a card that happens to be called Dawn. That's a very powerful effect. Now, Wraths are generally fine to meh in Limited, really depending on their casting cost and what they do. Four mana's pretty fine, you know, that, that's Wrath of God territory. However, it only hits power three or greater, but that does hit all the bombs, which means that you can very carefully craft around this. You can drop your two twos, you can drop your one ones, your one threes, your two fours, whatever. Your opponent drops something a little bit bigger, maybe a bomb, and then you can wrath, and it might not be uh, symmetrical, which, which is great. Just as always with Wraths, make sure that you play around this. Don't play your bombs all willy-nilly knowing that this is in your deck. Obviously, if you have an opening and it's the right play, do it. But, you know, if it's in your hand, don't play your bomb. 
sandbag for a couple turns, cast this, get them, and then get in. Uh, the dawn part of this just feels real bad to me. Taking a turn off to get a bunch of two drops, or I don't know, overpriced three or four drops to your hand for the next turn, that doesn't seem great. So I'm going to start this at B minus just for dust, uh, with of course the caveat that you play carefully around it and get the best value out of it. Dawn doesn't really affect the grade. It's not something I'm on the on the the lookout for, but. If I get some value out of it, cool, I'll do it when I can, but it's not really going to make this grade any higher. And the fact that it's free doesn't mean that it's going to make the grade any lower either. So that's going to wrap it up for today. We're done the first set review. We're done white. Tomorrow we'll take a look at blue and then black, red, green, and then the miscellaneous. Let me know in the comments down below what your favorite card is in white. I'm super excited to play with the Angel of Sanctions. Uh, I really like Vizier of Deferment. I'm going to play that card so, so much. Let me know in the comments down below. And of course, talk with me, talk with each other about the set, about what grades you agree with, what grades you disagree with, etc. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Mana League. That's L E E K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can also find me at facebook.com slash the Mana League, twitch.tv slash the Mana League, and patreon.com slash the Mana League. If you want to become a backer there, work your way towards earning a playmat, etc. If you do like the content, please click that thumbs up button. It super helps with the discoverability of the content. Click subscribe if you want to see more. And if you do have those questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow for the Blue Set Review.